the cloud. Hello, hello, everybody. Um, today we are going to be talking about the pelvic floor in the female pelvis and the reproductive system. So not to leave the guys out, we will certainly do a lesson on another day about that. But today the highlight is really going to be about the anatomy of the pelvic floor and some things that we might see uh, post-pregnancy or as we age or both. Um, and how specifically understanding the anatomy behind the pelvic floor and the reproductive system, understanding that anatomy can go such a really long way in choosing and selecting your class plan design when you're putting together a class. Now, let it be known that outside of the highlight being prenatal yoga at the moment, this is a really great restorative yoga class. So if this is your jam, um, then you're going to want to take a million notes. Um, generally speaking, whether you are teaching a restorative yoga class or a prenatal yoga class, either way, uh, you're going to want to pull out the props. So this would be the exception where generally I say less is more on the props. You really only want a couple of props so that you don't one overwhelm or intimidate your students, but two, um, take over from the time and the attention it takes to actually get a prop, use a prop, clean a prop, inspect a prop, pass out a prop, have the prop used, clean a prop, put the prop back, make sure you have enough props for everybody, right? It's the instructor's responsibility to make sure that the props are clean and in proper use and not anywhere or tear or anything else like that. So that is, that is up to us to make sure that that happens. So in that way, generally speaking, for most other styles of yoga, I recommend more than two pops, no, no more than like two props or so. Uh, so that's something that you're going to just want to keep in mind. Um, for this though, for restorative yoga though, or prenatal yoga though, uh, we want to pull them all out. So when I taught my restorative yoga class yesterday, what I brought were two blocks, um, a blanket, a strap, and a bolster. And so some of the different uses we had for the different props, we'll play around with that in the lab a little bit. Uh, but some of the uses we have is building a ramp with the bolster by setting one block on its end upright, another block sandwiched right next to it sideways, and then a bolster diagonally this way over it. And then you, you cue the students to line their hips up with the edge of the bolster so that they can just recline back. Once there, you can use any sort of props, but you would want to you'd want to consider the center of gravity and what's going on with the pelvic floor. So sometimes if we start using things like straps to move the limbs and such like that, it might be best to come off of the bolster ramp. Uh, but the difference between a restorative yoga class and a prenatal yoga class is that in prenatal yoga, they can only be on their back for a very short time. Like the whole class, a couple of minutes max. So the idea is to keep them off of their back and the ramp solves that, uh, whereas that's not necessary in the restorative yoga class. That being said, I do feel like if you're going to be doing things like lifting the legs um, with the strap, or if you're coming into a staff pose, a dindasana pose, and you're using a strap so that you can flex the feet and straighten the knees and therefore stretch the west, which is what they say when we stretch the backside, when that happens, um, you know, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't involve a ramp. What I have done in the past though, is set the ramp up just on the backside of the mat and then brought the students all the way forward so that the ramp is already set up. Although in my experience, um, students, sometimes can knock the ramp over and then they feel bad and it's uncomfortable and all that. So the way I did my class yesterday for restorative yoga, I had a private session for a couple, they came in, uh, I got them all the way just before Shavasana. And at that point, I then had them in a comfortable cross-legged pose on the center of their mat. And I, I invited them just to close their eyes and work on some pranayama technique that I set into motion. And then I came behind them and let them know I was coming and I set the ramp up for them. So this has been the most effective way uh, to deliver this ramp thing without it being fumbly or people not really knowing what to do or feeling unsure or anything else like that. Let them enjoy their pranayama while you set up the ramp. That won't work if you have a class of 30 people 
Um, but then again, if you have a class of 30 people, I'm not sure that we're building ramps. So, you know, it depends. Maybe you're a really great multitasker. Uh, so when we consider the uh, female pelvis, and if you want to order this book, um, it, I will post it in the announcements for you in Slack. Um, but if you're looking at the, pel the female pelvis, if you're looking at the bones and joints involved, we have, uh, Where's my singing bowl? My singing bowl. Eve, will you pass me that black singing bowl? Thank you, my dear. Thank you. Music lessons to come now. <laughs> Thank you, my sweet. Um, okay, so when we when we consider what's going on with the pelvic floor and why yoga is so beneficial, is commonly. We as teachers might invite our practitioners to have the pelvis be nice and level as if to have, you know, filled with water. We wouldn't want to spill it by tipping it forward and back. And that is that is self, uh, I think most students can self-correct easily enough um, if, if they tend to bring their pelvis forward or if they tend to send it back is whether or not the lumbar spine is upright um, or perhaps if there's a curvature coming forward or sending back. And so that's a great way to, to serve them as far as posture goes. Uh, but what often is left out in, in the presentation of a class is that left right thing. And so let's let's pretend our practitioner is just a little off to the left there, a little down left, upright. This is so common um, and can create any number of problems for the student in that we're going to have a difference in how long or short the connective tissues and then by extension, the muscles are of the pelvic floor. And that can onset any number of, um, of problems, one of which commonly is seen as low back pain. So we want to try and teach our practitioners to find that nice level way without pointing out anything that might feel them uncomfortable or they might move into a period of explaining why it is that they've got a sway back or they're rounding their lumbar spine. Uh, it's our job to hold space in yoga so that when our students come, it's a joyable, uh, lovely experience, not one that they have to explain their medical background to you, you know, cause that's never fun. I mean, maybe, I don't know, for me, it's no I, I don't really want to get into all that. I came for yoga. So, but as teachers, it's important that we understand that if we look at where the pelvic floor meets the lumbar spine, is the lumbar spine comes up this way. If it's tilted in any way, it's going to impact what's happening with the lumbar spine. And once that happens, then we're going to start to see the, um, the whole spine is going to, to lose the symphony of this upright place with the natural curvatures that are involved between the lumbar spine, thoracic spine, and cervical spine being lumbar spine, low back, thoracic spine, mid back and cervical spine neck. So if we, if we consider the essence of how important it is to have that pelvic floor nice and level before we move into strengthening the muscles of the pelvic floor, Otherwise we might find we're strengthening the muscles in an imbalanced way. And so um, some folks that go to physical therapy actually uh, come to physical therapy and they may have a very strong pelvic floor. Maybe they do quite a bit of Pilates or yoga or whatever they do, Kegels, whatever they do. Uh, but they've been doing it with an with a imbalanced bowl. Um, sometimes we actually have to <clears throat> bring back the muscular um, uh, definition let it let it slim down a little bit and then rebuild from a nice level place. Now, why this really matters <clears throat> on the prenatal yoga side, even say something like conception is if you have a practitioner who's attempting to get pregnant and they're having a hard time, there are some things that can hinder pregnancy. So staying in my scope of practice, regardless of my knowledge, it would sound something like this. When we strengthen the pelvic floor to need be nice and balanced and have that symmetry that we're looking for through the spine, it is more likely that an embryo will attach and remain attached in that structure, right? Makes sense. 
So if we jostle something, if we shake up a, a bottle of carbonated water, then it's gonna kind of spray everywhere. So would that be what I told my student? Uh, I don't know, you guys could probably find a way to clean up the idea. But the idea is very much there. If we have a nice sound steady environment, an embryo is more likely to remain attached or even to attach in a, in a welcoming environment, if you will. Um, on the other side of things, we have, let's say breath work, for example. Uh, if we are in a state with our anatomy of fight or flight because of stress, our bodies will shut down certain systems. So for those of you that caught the anatomy lessons early in the week, you might get a little more out of this lesson than if you hadn't, but try to get them soon. If not, um, it will shut down the digestive system. It will shut down the reproductive system and some of the other system. But these are two I'm gonna to mention today. So as we consider, if we have a practitioner who's attempting to get pregnant and is stressed out about it, that it's actually lessening the chance that she'll be able to get pregnant because her body might be in fight or flight and therefore not encouraging a habitat for procreation. So the anatomy, physiology, and procreation piece is just so incredibly, incredibly important. Um, reading from the book here, yoga helps to prepare you for delivery and can be a good friend to guide you through childbirth and the time afterwards. That's why the chapter deals with the stages of labor and the, the changes in your body after delivery. So this also applies to uh, instructors who maybe don't wanna teach prenatal yoga, but they did have a student and maybe the student took the time off uh, during the pregnancy and now is back. It's helpful to have uh, some kind of idea on what might have taken place in their body and how you can serve them best now that they're back and what, instruct, what restrictions they might want to um, keep in mind of uh, for a time, for a time until the body completely heals, which is really months to be truthful, it's months. Um, so it's not right away and it's not necessarily as soon as the student feels it's good in their body, um, definitely not prior to medical clearance, but at the same time, there's just so many factors that could change that, that I take personal responsibility on what I invite my practitioner to do if I know they gave birth four weeks ago, you know? So thinking about that, um, if, if you had the book, if three, if page 386, it's for you, Eve, page, page 386, uh, goes into a little bit more of what's happening inside the body, uh, the pelvic organ. So when we talk about things like, let's say serving um, uh, silver sneakers community, active aging community, we might have um, leakage, very common. And so I know I saw a course out there like belly dancing, solving leakage. And I was, I applauded. I'm like, thank you for bringing that forward to all the people. That's great because belly dancing does so much with that pelvic floor. It's a really mindful practice. So it's likely to address what's happening with the pelvic bowl. And as we build the muscular tissue around that, then we might see less leakage. And so that's actually kind of cool thing to know, right? So again, understanding, you know, these different kind of things. Um, yoga asana creates freedom and flexibility in the hip joint. and also helps to keep two bone partners of the joint firmly connected, which helps to prevent uh, any number of, of issues that might come up from that. There's a list here. So if we think about if we think about our pelvic floor and we think about the flexibility that's happening in the hips, uh, commonly we see um, some pressure on the mid back, the thoracic spine during pregnancy, uh, often because the breasts enlarge and become um, kind of throw off the yogi center of balance. They might find their balance is different than it was before, uh, but more so that their spine is beginning to move forward and the mid back is doing what it can to kind of stabilize that. And then the low back quite likely will take a little bit of a hit because of that too. So again, like helping your practitioners if they're considering getting pregnant, really spending time on let's strengthen and balance that pelvic floor and let's keep an eye on posture and let's keep an eye on stress. So those are three things. If you have a yoga student who says, we're looking to get pregnant. Well, now you know, those are a few things that you do to help them in their journey um, that would be considered within your scope of practice. If they are in pregnant, if they are pregnant, I do not recommend um, 
um, teaching them, unless you've had this training, there's quite a bit here, but the one, the one point I want to make sure every one of my teacher know, and I repeat it a few times a year, is we want to be really mindful about the arms overhead. If we bring the arms overhead, we in all probability lengthen the uterus. So we go from the uterus this way, which isn't quite perfect circular donut, but it does when we bring the arm overhead, it does oblong the uterus. And so you can see this too, Eve? Yes. Uh -huh. Oblong, you know this anyway, oblong uterus. And we have a greater, yeah, we have a greater probability of a detachment of an embryo with, with this going on. So we don't want this. So this it's helpful for practitioners that want to come to yoga when they're pregnant because um, they might not know that arms overhead is one of the biggest reasons we have a miscarriage. And so if they go home and they're just reaching for something on a shelf, which seems perfectly fine to do, right? Um, that's actually a, a, a really encouraging way to lose the pregnancy. So that's something that you want to know. And so by default, anybody who has any reason for not wanting to bring the arms overhead, the next few sequences that we talk about, the shoulder girl and such, uh, hopefully will help complement that. So let's say we have someone with frozen shoulder. And so um, commonly frozen shoulder means you can't bring your arms over the head. That's, that's what it is. And so instead of arms come overhead, easy to go to, hands in prayer. So you can even use that same modification in your class for anything that you're doing. If you're taking a class sequence that you have composed that was previously power yoga, and instead of having the arms overhead, invite them to bring their arms in prayer, not because they can't do it or if it feels more comfortable, but just because that's your sequence, your chosen sequence of the day, then it can be really nice for the practitioner to slide the arms from overhead back to heart center and have a new place for the arms to go. So if we have rotator cuff tears, if we have frozen shoulder, anything like that, pregnancy, we don't want the arms going overhead. Now, as you get deeper into the pregnancy, the arms can begin to go over the head and it's okay. Um, but that's like the first cautionary tale. So that's the one that I sent out right away. Particularly, some people might not exactly have their conception date um, accurate, you know? So no arms overhead. The other reason I don't do arms overhead, even if they're in the third trimester and that'd be fine, we might have that tenderness in the tissues of the breasts and bringing the arms overhead just isn't comfortable. So hands to heart center is the way to go. I think for um, shoulder, for pregnancy, for rotator cuff tears, um, or even just fatigue, maybe looking for a nurturing, a gentle yoga class, that's just a simple one that you could write in on your creative classes under the modification is hands in prayer rather than overhead. It's a, it's a nice go-to for any of your classes, regardless of, regardless of what style you're teaching, even including a very athletic um, kind of power yoga. <clears throat> that might be what's considered the rest. It's just bringing the arms down. Uh, that being said, we burn more calories with the arms overhead than not. So if that's the goal of your class, then we probably want to get those arms moving if they're not the population that we've talked about. Uh, okay, so we've talked about strengthening the pelvic floor and why that might help uh, with leakage. Um, as we talk about the shoulder girdles and the relationship between the two, I'm going to pull out from your anatomy book, since we all have a copy of that. Okay. And let's just go to warrior two. And in case you didn't know in the back, there's a Sanskrit in index, but there's also an English index. I didn't know that for a long time. So the English index going to warrior two, Finding that I'm on page 58 because I have the first version, which I prefer over the second. If you have the second, I recommend getting the first. Um, it's out of print, so you probably have to um, maybe get it used books or <clears throat> online or something like that. But I think it's just more direct and a little cleaner. The knowledge is more palpable for me. So if you come to Warrior II, uh, we see that we have um, the back side, the back leg is engaged all the way into the pelvic floor, as are the quadriceps on the opposite leg. 
And then when we switch side, the same things happen on the other side. So what might happen then is if we have our pelvic floor and let's say there's a little bit of an imbalance, one, one cue, one, one um, sneak peek of knowing what's going on there is if it's stronger on the right side than the left side, and commonly it is if, if somebody is right-handed, then you might see their warrior two look much different on the right side than it does on the left side. And that's going to be a nice indicator to you that perhaps the pelvic floor is balanced. So you might wanna do a little bit more um, detective work, you know, before pointing that out to your student, it's be any other number of reasons. But if even if there is another reason this is happening, like maybe one leg shorter, one may, maybe one side stronger, the problem with that is we're going to start to build an imbalance in yoga class of the left and right side of the pelvic floor. And so that's something that we do want to pay attention to. And so particularly, let's say you're teaching a private session in class, because those are kind of everywhere right now. And you see that one person favors that right side, we're going to want to try and bridge the gap so that we can start to see more uh, unity on the left and right side of the pelvic floor. And that's really the big takeaway for that. Um, Leslie Kavanaugh quotes, there, there's no law of the universe that says certain movements must be done on an inhale and other movements must be done on an exhale. You might choose an asana to experiment with. Try the opposite breathing patterns of whatever your breathing habits are. And if you learn something, see if you learn something, Leslie Kamenoff. And so that's one of my favorite, favorite, favorite one. Um, because if you do see that the right side is favored when, you're, when your practitioner moves into warrior two each and every time, um, invite them to change up their breath patterns because that can be one of the, the best ways to just break the habit of what they would typically normally get into. So um, for me, this shows up when I externally rotate my left hip versus my right hip. I have some orthopedic things. I don't really want to talk about it in yoga class, but when I externally rotate my left hip, that's going to look different than the right. So that's going to show up in my tree pose. Um, that's going to show up in my great seal pose. Um, and my child pose and my frog pose and all of these poses that aren't even necessarily considered advanced, it's going to show up. And there is some work I could do, but then there's, you know, just that is what it is at a certain point too. So honoring um, and holding space for that. Um, know that though, uh, I can tell you personally, I can't speak for anybody else, but I can tell you personally, um, it's been my experience that I do tend to favor the more comfortable side. And so what's that, what that's going to do is that's going to increase the gap between how level the left side of the pelvic floor is from the right. So that's just something maybe to throw in your back pocket, not to say everybody does that, but I would think, say it's fair to say that that's pretty common to occur. So the next posture we're gonna go into in our anatomy book for those of you that caught some of these, and in case you didn't realize with the anatomy sequence with Shane, it is heady, there is no final, you don't have to recite that back or learn Latin. I do want you to have an understanding of just how much uh, yoga can impact the body. Um, but in the end, that whole sequence breaks out to the sun salutation series. So it can be really helpful to try and um, spend a week or two on the anatomy. And that might mean you still come back to it again, that's fine, um, but just kind of considering that. So. Uh, in prenatal yoga, we almost always want to see a, a squat, a garland pose. Um, if we are looking here, let's see, let's see, let's see. In our nifty book for resources here for you. If we come to bound angle pose, 92. This can be a really, really nice one A 92 to accomplish that same sort of thing that we would see in a garland pose standing, but now we're sitting. Uh, this is an, also an opportunity for you to observe if you noticed on the right side that 
the warrior too was favored on the right side rather than the left, then maybe when you bring them down, look for it, you know, is the right knee higher than the left? And, you know, if so, could we do some stuff to kind of bridge that gap a little bit for your practitioner? Uh, so this bound angle pose is perfectly acceptable um, for a prenatal student. And the second trimester is the most forgiving trimester of all. The third is really just whatever you can do. The first there's the most contraindications in the first. Um, so if you go to two pages later, you start to see the ramp that I was talking about. So I build this ramp in every one of my classes because I teach easy yoga, gentle yoga, restorative yoga, and prenatal yoga. And commonly, I really only do private sessions at this point in my career. Not to say that I don't ever do group, but I don't tend to. So here, if we have recline bound angle pose, this is a really nice one where she's reclined back. So she's not on her back. So you could have her here the whole entire class. This is maybe what mama to be just needs is some R and R and some TLC. You know, um, we have the ramp built with the bolster in the two blocks. One blocks is upright. One is sideways. They're nice and tight together. And you, you give it a little shimmy to make sure it's solid. Uh, here we've used a strap to invite the soles of the feet together uh, in that it comes over the ankles, over the front of the thighs, and then straps around back behind the lumbar spine. And essentially what it does is it allows the knees just to fall open and be open however open that is. Maybe that's a little open, maybe it's a lot open, uh, but the strap is carrying the weight so the practitioner doesn't have to actively work in order to allow those knees to fall open. Now, one reason this is such a nice one for prenatal yoga or restorative yoga or anybody who's rehabbing from any kind of injury, to be honest with you, is previously we talked about how we could strengthen the pelvic floor. And I mentioned garland pose um, as we come down into like a malasana, deep into that we're working, we're working the muscles here, we're releasing the muscles. So there's this difference between releasing the muscles and working the muscles. And in yoga, we attempt to do both. And it's my opinion that it's best if you can thread it throughout the class, rather than this is the work time, that's the release time. I like to release throughout. Um, and that's one thing that is accomplished by teaching an all levels class. So when a practitioner comes in and you say, okay, we're going to be moving into malasana, um, and they're standing and before they get too far down, you can invite them to maybe they want to sit on a block when they when they get a little further down. Uh, or you can tell them for those of you that don't want to go all the way down, by all means, don't feel don't don't feel pressure to come all the way down. For someone with very tight hips coming all the way down to a deep melissa is a very difficult pose to do. So it's nice if you're adding these suggestions as you come in throughout the class, because then organically you're offering through modifications, you're offering uh, an interplay between work, release, work, release, work, release. Uh, release. A release is considered uh, more permanent in nature, meaning the lengthening will stay lengthened if held at least for a minute. So closer to two or somewhere between. So if you offer a release that's five seconds long, that's great, but it might not have that um, that permanency that your student otherwise could benefit from or for allowing more time. So try and put it in there, um, of course, when the practitioner is warm. This is when we want to do this kind of work. So back to this particular reclined bound angle pose, um, resting, laying down to sleep. Obviously an amazing Shavasana. Um, I set this up for all of my Shavasana classes and my students really appreciate it and come to love it. And also um, you don't have to go as far as the four little pillows underneath the forearms and the knees. But I mean, if you have them, um, some studios have uh, blankets right now, whether or not they can, cannot be used or accessible, they're not accessible, uh, equates to why something like this is really fitting for private sessions or in-home sessions, which is, um, is in really high demand. There, uh, I would say the prenatal population is highly underserved population. And at this point in my career, I don't really have the bandwidth to go do home visits for people, uh, but I can tell you that it is in need. And it's a, it's a lucrative um, uh, way for a yogi to you know, make a living 
doing this, um, or at least complement what they're up to. Uh, so, okay, if we go to the second, want to explore the upper body a little bit on this one. So we're going to go to mountain. And that is page 34 if you have the first edition. Uh, okay. If we go onto mountain and we look at the shoulder girdle here, it is said the state of yoga is attained via a balance between abhyasa and virigaya. So finding, it's always a balance between never give up and learn to let go. Never get up, give up and learn to let go. So let's unpack that. Sometimes we hear in yoga, um, Let's move towards our yogic edge. So a yogic edge is that place in before pain, in my definition, before pain, but we're nearing it. Like if we went much further, we might end up in pain, but we're not going to end up in pain. That's the yogic edge. So it's before pain. Other people might describe it as painful, but I do not feel personally that there's a place for pain in yoga. So that's hands up, right? Like, you know, not arming. That's, that's my take on it. That's my two cents. There's my elevator speech. Um, but on the other side, though, it could be is equally difficult for your practitioner not to so much move towards the yogic edge, but to help them. Um, let it go and maybe just be in the place they're at and, and find joy there. Um, I know we had, um, we had a uh, training a couple of weeks ago and I want to say the term and Dana, you can type it in if you remember it. I want to say the term was destination happiness, happiness destination. Is that right? You can pop that if you, yes, a destination happiness. Is that what it is? So it, it suggests that when I get here, I'll be happy then. And the whole idea is to dispel that and just be happy here now. And every now that shows up equals a lifetime of happiness. And so it's also one thing that can go a long way in um, finding peace, uh, surrender, acceptance in, in the moment. And so if you haven't had a chance to get those lessons from storytelling with K on Teachable, it's like step one thing, one for a reason, always going back to that. And again, you can double dip on hours if you caught them in the beginning of your training, but it's been a little while, listen to them again and award yourself your hours for that. Maybe you'll see it from a different lens or apply it in a different way. Uh, but as we're far referring to our mountain pose and we consider what's going on with uh, the pathways of weight, um, the right arm and shoulder girdle will greatly change if the hands are facing forward than if they are facing the body. Now, depending on the movements of the practitioner each day, you might find some want to have their hands further forward and others might want to have them face the body. My theory on that is not to cue it, just let them go where they want to go. Because mountain posture, there's so so many pieces of mountain posture to unpack that maybe that can be an opportunity for them just to learn to let it go and just be be in the place they want to be with the shoulder girdle and maybe that'll free up some resources for them to spend some time on what's happening with the spine so an idea on what's happening the spine being upright straight up and down um, with the natural curvatures of course uh, might be more of where i put my emphasis and a lengthening of the top of the head towards the earth. You know, you might've heard the, the uh, imagine you have a little string tied to the top of your crown is lifting the body up like a marionette doll. You know, eyebrows tend to raise when you, when you give this cue. Um, and at the same time, connecting the soles of the feet with the earth and finding some space, uh, as much space in between each vertebra as you possibly can. So we're not looking for a rimrod straight back, but we are looking for this um, 
this posture is exhibited here in the book. Now, the tricky part about it is though, when we have pregnancy and I touched on it earlier is we might have, you know, tender tissues with the breasts. We might have a tendency to lean forward. We might see a rounding, a rounding of the shoulders coming forward because it's uncomfortable. So, I mean, again, this might be an opportunity where do we want to encourage our prenatal students to stand upright? Oh yeah. But is there also a place to learn to let it go where that's just extremely uncomfortable for them right now? And we're just going to try and make them comfortable. And so maybe the standing posture isn't really the posture that day, you know, and that's okay. So, um, and that can be the case um, with any number of populations, anybody who has shoulder injury, anybody who has neck injury, um, scoliosis, rotator cuff tears, frozen shoulders, the list goes on and on. Anytime we start to see a disconnect between the anatomy that we view in this book and an imbalance between that and the people that walk through the door. And I can tell you that's 98% of the people. And that is why, you know, it's being said more and more and more and more that, you know, the real gurus of yoga, they're not teaching the acrobatic, um, gymnastic style of yoga asana that was seen with Patabi Joyce early in Krishnamacharya's career, they're seeing more and more of this more forgiving, um, work your way into a posture that will serve you where the benefits outweigh the risks that we start to see more in the, in the end, towards the end of Krishnamacharya's career with his son, Deskachar. And that is the person who trained Leslie Kamenov. So because of that, and I'm training with Leslie Kavanaugh directly and Amy Matthews for sure, but she's more of a granular teacher and that kind of blows up my mind a little. So I like Leslie's style, it's more in broad strokes. Um, that will of course impact any lesson that I give to you. So by all means, if that does not ring as true for you, then you feel free to run with whatever works for you. But there is the reason for it. And so um, some common things we're seeing is we're spending all this time in mountain pose, trying to get um, an awareness in and around um, the pelvic floor, the posture, the connecting with the earth, the lightness and levity um, found by allowing the head to rise. Uh, we're encouraging a dristi, a gaze forward, dristi, Sanskrit gaze forward. Um, all of this, the last thing I'm really thinking about is where they want to place the hands. And so the thing is, is in these two books authored by Leslie Kamenoff and Amy Matthews, in one picture, the hands are facing the body and another they're facing forward. So I can just tell you they're is not a right or wrong on this thing. And it really depends on lineages. And it also depends on the state and the viewpoint of the asana of, of, of whoever your guru is at the time and what they were thinking and sharing and telling people at the time, it can change over time and has. So if you caught my lesson like five years ago, it was largely about power yoga. And let's see if we can fight the obesity epidemic happening in, in this country um, with yoga. And now I'm talking a lot more about self-love, self-care, refilling thy cup, uh, the benefits on the uh, neurological system through meditation, and then also all the other systems within the body, including the reproductive system. Um, so maybe you could, um, Aaron, since you did the <clears throat> reproductive system, let's take two minutes and I would just like you just share a little information about what you got out of that reproductive system. Um, and then I'll read that out. So it's on the recording and everyone can hear. And then Dana, dealer's choice, take two, two minutes and just author something about one of the systems that you, that you received from the anatomy over this week. And then we can just do a little bit of share and that will be the springboard for when you guys are in lab here shortly. So we'll take two minute break and then we will get to that. And then I will read what you guys wrote.
Okay, welcome back, everybody. Going to do a little reading from the chat here. Just as very soon as we have our feedback on the anatomical systems as it refers to the reproductive system. And you know what I like? I like um, not really details, but I'd rather the broad strokes uh, to be given in training because that's what I want you to give to the students. So when a student comes in, they don't necessarily want the anatomical foundation of what it is you're doing, uh, but they want something that they can repeat to their friends, you know? And so if we consider, um, if we consider the ligaments and the um, attachments of the ligaments to the pelvic floor, that if we can obtain something that's headed in the direction of symmetry, because I don't know that symmetry truly exists. Um, I'm reading here, if you have the prenatal book, 389, Helpful Yoga Sanas. During pregnancy, there is a loosening of all the ligament structures of the uterus. Therefore, it is very important to retighten these ligaments after birth to regain, regain their original form. In the inverted postures of yoga, the ligaments no longer have the support, have to support the weight of the organs since the gravitational effect is reversed there is a relaxation of the ligaments. In combination with a certain amount of leg and pelvic floor work in these positions, the ligaments are toned and tightened and they regain their former elasticity. So with that being said, when we bring a student from mountain pose, post-pregnancy, let's say four months, six months, let's just play it really safe. Let's say six months after pregnancy, doctors probably given clearance, uh, make sure they did. Uh, you know, the, the difference between mountain pose and headstand is, is going to be great. And this would be an opportunity of why, um, why we want those inversions is because those ligaments are working so hard throughout to support the weight of the the organs because of gravity. Now, does that mean that we need to do a headstand to obtain this? Um, no, I wouldn't say that. Um, but I would say that something like legs up the wall is a really nice opportunity to move gravity out of the equation and start to find balance within these ligaments. And also there's a nice guide for your practitioners on what's happening with their feet. They're level, they're not level. And you can just bring some awareness around that to the practitioners. We don't ever want anyone to feel like they're doing it wrong or they're not, they don't feel good, but they may not even realize the impact of having that kind of balance. And it might even be that one leg is longer than the other and you know, for which they have shoes for that and, and other kind of things that can be done. It can definitely make a very big difference. Um, as far as which system you want to you want to speak on in chat, it's whichever system you want to speak on in chat. There's, there's no right or wrong in that. Um, as I move though, while I wait for that, as I move to page 37, which is two pages after mountain pose, just fill up the page after mountain pose, you're going to see the structure of what's happening with the feet. So again, when we do legs up the wall, which the back is on the floor and the feet are in the sky up against a wall, we have an opportunity to kind of play around with the base that we might have gotten when we were in mountain pose and to see what's going on. And that would be fitting for any yoga class. And it's a great Shavasana. I had a teacher once who did Shavasana with legs up the wall and people loved it. So we just moved stuff out of the way so that there was a wall space to do it with. So that's something to consider beforehand. Uh, but it is not appropriate for a prenatal student. 
because their back is on the ground. And there is no real way to do legs up the wall on a ramp and also on a wall and find comfort, particularly if they're in the second or third trimester. So those are just some things to consider and that you can implement um, from there. Uh, so with that, um, I am going to go ahead and call a two minute break. And then those in lab can build on the impact of the anatomy lessons that they received earlier in the week in regards to some of the conversations that we've had today. And also create a class of four postures that includes legs up the wall, a squat or malasana, And then what other, other, other two you wanna do? And uh, when you're done with that, snap a picture of your work, submit it into Slack as a direct message as you always do, type in the title so I know what I am looking at, of course, and award your el yourself the two hours, one for the lecture, one for the lab. And again, there isn't a set number of how many lecture hours or how many lab hours there are. That is an individual case by case, student by student basis. 